tonight uh, we're picking up where we left off last week in our series titled The Teachings of Jesus. And as uh, most of you know, uh, who've been coming these past few weeks, we've been covering uh, Jesus' example and his model of prayer. Uh, put another way, we're asking the question, how did Jesus, how did the Son of God pray? And therefore, as his disciples, how do we pray? And at this point, I think it would be good for us to review the context, because whenever we're reading scripture, we always want to keep in mind and and even try to envision the setting. Uh, That is, where is this passage taking place? Who's there? What's going on in the background? Who's Jesus talking to? And so in this case, what we have is Jesus sitting on a hill surrounded by his first disciples. So these are men who have given up jobs, left their families, and they committed to follow Jesus wherever he went, from city to city, town to town, as they learned to uh, and imitate his teachings and lifestyle. And by the way, that's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means you have actually committed your life to learning and imitating That is not just knowing about Jesus, but putting into practice his way of life so that you look, so that you sound, so that you act like Jesus. Uh, You believe what he believes, you love what he loves, and you value what he values. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so it's in this setting when with Jesus surrounded by men who have given up everything to follow him that he teaches them how to pray how to talk with their father in heaven. And this means that if we're truly his disciples, then Jesus is teaching you tonight how to pray. So let's go ahead and read our passage, pray, and then dig in. Father in heaven, I ask that you would grant us spiritual wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of your son, Jesus, that you would wash us afresh with a clear vision of who he is for us. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, arouse in us a deeper, more fuller commitment to him and just refresh us with how much he loves us and how much he's for us. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now to begin, I want to make a few observations about the structure of this prayer because there is a structure. Uh, You may have noticed, but it's definitely worth mentioning that verses 9 and 10 consist of three petitions, three requests, all focused on God. One topic, God. Start reading with me at verse 9. Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then beginning at verse 11, the prayer shifts focus from God to us. Uh, So if you look at verse 11, Jesus prays, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this structure, it's so important to note because it teaches us that the, the pattern, the normal rhythm of Christian prayer begins with God, not us. The worship of his name, the advancement of his kingdom, the fulfillment of his will. These are the top concerns and desires of Jesus's followers. Put simply, in this example, Jesus teaches us to have God centered prayers, not man centered. And I I really do think that this is the major reason why so many of our prayer lives feel empty and devoid and like you're talking to a ceiling because so often we treat God like Santa Claus. Uh, Our prayers basically amount to like an Amazon Christmas wish list. Prayers like, dear God, please help me to do good on this test that I didn't study for. Please, I need that wisdom now. Uh, Please help this greasy cheeseburger and fried french fries give nourishment to my body. Make them vegetables, Lord, please. Jesus, help us all have a good week and safe travels, please. Now, trust me, as we will see, God cares very deeply about all those personal needs. Um, He really does. Uh, You've already seen that this the entire second half of the prayer is dedicated to you. Uh, But when all our prayers, when all our conversations with God consist consist of trite, 
cliche, scripted sayings that focus only on ourselves, we can see why our prayers feel shallow. You know why? Because they are. <laughs> see, Jesus teaches us to pray bigger, grander. Uh, he wants us to request, to desire uh, more from our Father in heaven than somehow making this chicken tender healthy for our body. He wants you to pray for more than safe travels and, and a really good week. And the question I want to ask, is that really all you want from the person who created the universe? Well, not Jesus. Jesus wants to see a worldwide global worship of God's name uh, from the small island of Papua New Guinea to the whole continent of Africa. People from every tribe, tongue and nation bowing on their knees in adoration of the king. That's Jesus's desire. He wants your friends and your family to, to submit to God's authority and receive eternal life. He wants God to defeat evil, eliminate suffering, and bring about the end of the age. He wants more than a healthy chicken nugget. He, and he wants us to as well. Uh, when talking about this idea of, of desiring too little, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, the art, author of Chronicles of Narnia, any fans? Hey, you're right. All right, so C.S. Lewis, this is the quote he had. It's an amazing quote. He said, It would seem that our Lord Jesus finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation or a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Students, it's, it's not that we desire too much. It's that we desire too little. And the content of our prayers, our requests, our conversations with God serve they, they, as this filter to expose this reality. And again, I want to be careful. Don't misunderstand me. Our father in heaven, he is fully invested in the smallest details of your life down to the hairs on your head. He's got them numbered. He knows them all. Uh, but we must learn to pray both small and big, both personal and global prayers. That is, as Jesus' disciples, he teaches us to want something bigger than ourselves. And, and this really leads us to the third petition made in Jesus' prayer. So start reading with me again at verse 9. Jesus says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And here's the third petition. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, the word will uh, basically refers to a desire, uh, a, a wish. Uh, so we could translate this petition something like, Father, let what you want happen. Uh, or let what you desire come to be. In other words, this is a prayer of submission. So that when we say your will be done, we're praying, Father, bring about your plan. Uh, Father, fulfill your purposes for my life in the world. And I think to, to gain a better understanding of what it looks like to pray, your will be done in real life. What does it look like to pray that prayer? We don't have to look any further than the life of Jesus. Because near the end of his life, as he awaited and prepared uh, for the severe trial of the crucifixion, he got along with his father in heaven and he prayed. He got along with God and he prayed. And later in the book of Matthew, we uh, have a record of that prayer session. So be, oh, dang. I didn't give you guys the reference sheet. Oh. Well, listen in. Starting at verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with them, his disciples, and so he's with his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And so as Jesus and the disciples, they arrive in this place called Gethsemane. Uh, it's an olive orchard. And Jesus takes his closest disciples, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he's like, hey, you guys over here, you stay back and wait. 
And as Jesus and the three, they move farther away and deeper into this garden, into this olive orchard, uh, the reality of the cross begins to set in on Jesus. Uh, and Matthew says that he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Indeed, Jesus is filled with so much grief and anxiety. He tells the disciples in verse 38, Jesus, the son of God, says this. My soul, his innermost being is very sorrowful, even to death. And, and what Jesus means is that the weight of his fear and grief about what is about to take place, it's, it's so heavy. It's so agonizing. It's so intense that the only picture that can come close to describing the condition of his soul is death. Uh, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt so burdened by grief and sorrow and anxiety that your soul, it's like, I feel like death. Well, that's what Jesus is feeling in this moment. And to grasp why Jesus is so burdened, let me describe to you what awaits him in the final events of his life. Why is Jesus burdened? Why is he full of sorrow? Uh, let me give you a rundown about, about what's going to happen. First, all of his closest friends will abandon him. People who have spent three years like walking, eating, traveling, laughing, ministering with Jesus. They even promised they would never forsake him. In a matter of hours, all of them will deny that they ever knew him, leaving him all by himself to be falsely accused and arrested. And for those of you who have been betrayed by a friend, for those of you who have felt utter loneliness, then you have an idea of what Jesus must have felt. He then will undergo multiple beatings. Uh, which includes a, a whipping at the hands of trained soldiers that will literally rip the skin off his bones. Then after being beaten nearly to death, they will force Jesus to carry a cross up to the place where he will be mercilessly executed alone. Until so weakened by the beating from earlier, he falls to the ground in exhaustion and can't go any further. And, and since all of his friends deserted him, remember, uh, a random stranger has to help him carry that cross because he can't do it anymore. And when they arrive to the top for the finale, uh, Jesus will be stripped of his clothes, basically naked before all. And strong Roman soldiers are going to pound heavy iron nails through his wrist and feet so that he can hang suspended on this cross. Uh, and, and then a crowd of observers will Watch him struggle as to breathe. They're going to watch him struggle to breathe as blood, precious, holy, sinless, divine blood pours from his wounds. Wounds. He will hang there bleeding until he no longer has strength to like hold himself up to fill uh, his oxygen, uh, his lungs with oxygen so that he has increasingly less and less air to breathe until finally they will witness him suffocate to death. And then just for good measure, a Roman guard is going to ram a sharp spear into his side to make sure he's finished. And, and remarkably, <laughs> remarkably, the physical pain and agony of all that he's about to go to, through on the cross cannot compare to the spiritual condemnation Jesus endures as the full wrath of God is poured upon him on the cross, not for his sins, for ours. The reality is so overwhelming that Jesus can barely walk in this moment. Uh, Matthew writes that Jesus, he's, he's in this moment, he collapses to the ground in grief to plead with his father in prayer. And in verse 39, it says, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed and prayed. Now, during this time of prayer in Gethsemane, Jesus completes three sessions of prayer with his father, two of which are recorded. Uh, the first session is in the latter half of verse nine. Jesus prays, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then in verse 42, he prays similar words. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And what's interesting, those are the exact same words he taught us to pray. Despite knowing the unbelievable pain and suffering to come, Jesus willingly submits to his father's plan. He lays down his desires for the sake of accomplishing something greater. Our salvation and the glory of God's name. Students, that's what it means to pray your will be done. It means to surrender 
all of our hopes, all of our dreams and ambitions and desires to God saying, Father, not what I desire, but let your plan for my life be fulfilled. Even if it hurts, I trust you. I trust that you love me. I trust that you are good and faithful and wise. I trust that in the same way the cross brought about the hope of the salvation for the world, you will use every tear, every grief, every letdown in my life to bring about the good of your people and the glory of your name. And so we say with Jesus, your will be done. Now, note the words that follow this petition. Look back at verse 10. Jesus teaches us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this last phrase, it could be joined to each of the, these petitions we've been covering. It is to pray for God's name to be hallowed, God's kingdom to come, and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, whenever we pray these petitions, it's not uh, for, just, uh, for God to bring about the worship of his name, obedience to his authority, submission to his plan now, today in our lives. But it's also a prayer for God to bring about the end of the age, uh, the consummation of all things. And, and this means that when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're, we're asking God to come back and to vindicate his reputation, to vindicate his resume, to fully reveal himself in all his power and glory. This means that when we pray your kingdom come, we're saying, Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth, come back. <laughs> Fully establish your righteous rule once and for all. Let not one rebel remain. And when we pray your will be done, we're saying, God, complete your plan that was made in eternity past. Fulfill every single one of your purposes. In some, then, when we pray these three petitions, we're saying, Father, bring heaven to earth. Bring down heaven. Come. Make all things right. Let's pray. Father, we pray those petitions now. That your name would be hallowed. Your will would be done. And your kingdom would come. I pray that would be the top and highest desires of our hearts. And when suffering comes. And when challenges come in our life. And disappointments and tragedies and heartbreak. We will say your will be done as we find confidence in how Jesus' suffering brought about the salvation of the world. We know you can use it and we entrust ourselves to you. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.